Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, reporting to you from the overflow room. And boy, have I got a set for you. And it ain't overflow either. It is. Hold it a moment. Hold on to your hats. Finally, it's out. The Zoltan Conscious Box on DECA, formerly Philips. Oh, boy, we've been waiting for this for a long time, haven't we? Colchis was a brilliant, brilliant pianist who died in his mid-60s way, way too soon. He was also a terrific guy, someone who just loved music. Unfortunately, I only knew him toward the end of his life, but he was amazing, a marvel, both as a pianist and a conductor, and even to a degree as a composer. I mean, did you know that he completed Schoenberg's Moses und Aaron? He really completed it, like the whole third act. He's quite, quite a remarkable human being. In fact, you know, you know, Schnabel's teacher said of him, you know, you're not a pianist, you're a musician. And that was Kochis. He was a musician, all around musician, music first and foremost, piano second. However, he was also one hell of a pianist. And that's what makes this so exciting. There are like I said, 26 CDs in here. It's all he did for Decca Phillips. I, I, Hungariton deserves to put together a box of his stuff, his conducting and some other piano things. They really, really should. If they're smart, they will. But, you know, the fascinating thing about this is that there's nothing bad in it. Nothing at all. It's all good. doesn't mean everything is the best. You don't have to go into that. But nothing falls below a certain extraordinarily high level. And he focused his efforts on recording, at least for this label, on a select boutique group of composers. And quite frankly, in those performances, he's well nigh untouchable. I mean, really, he's as great as anyone ever could be. And boy, oh boy, that really says something. So let's go through the box. Let's see what's in it. And we will take it from there. I might also add that the notes, which are quite splendid, are by our very own Jed Distler, which is one of the reasons I get to review this. And he doesn't. Sorry, Jed. I know. Hopefully I won't, I won't disgrace the effort that he put into it. Anyway. Yes, you get this little booklet. It doesn't even have a track listing in it, by the way. The track listing is on the CDs, which are not original jackets. Just so you know, they're, well, oh, are they? They are original jackets. Look, they are. There you go. So uh, that's a nice thing. I was looking at them from behind. But boy, this, it's so much fun to get back to this stuff. There's some things that I had quite forgotten about, to be honest with you, good as they were, because it's just not music I spent a lot of time listening to. But... Uh, all right, hang on. Let me pull them all out here. They're all they're all out, and we're going to put them back. So first and foremost, here's an example of something I actually did have to go back and listen to because I hadn't heard it in years, and sort of don't listen to it even when I when I have heard it in years, or at least not in this form. The Art of Fugue by Batch. Now you know the Art of Fugue. It's kind of a didactic piece. But boy, this performance has so much personality. It's played with, with so much enthusiasm for the joy of contrapuntal intertwining, which is what this is. And uh, wow, it was really cool making its acquaintance again after, after all this time. I really got a lot of pleasure out of it. I like to listen to the Art of Fugue in arrangements for instruments mostly, you know, like a consort or things because it makes the parts clearer. But... Boy, this is pretty clear part playing. You can hear everything. And I just I just thought it was sp splendid, absolutely spectacular. So that was fun. I mean, the Art of Fugue is keyboard music. There's no question about that, by the way. And so it, it should be played that way. But how you choose to listen to it and how you choose to, to suck it in, let's put it that way, is um, entirely up to you. Next, Beethoven Sonatas. He did a disc of Beethoven's sonatas. These are wonderful performances of the Potatique and the Tempest and Sonata Number no. 5, Opus 10, Number no. 1, and Opus 2, Number no. 1, the F minor, which is sort of Beethoven's tribute to Haydn. And these are wonderful performances. They're not eccentric, but again, they're full of personality and, and, and sort of devilry, I think is the word. If you knew the man, you'd know 
that he had that he had that kind of kind of mischievous quirkiness about him. It was never unmusical, and it never it never um, sort of trespassed the 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 expressive point of the music. But he used it in his phrasing and his handling of rhythm and accent just to bring the music to life and to make you sit up and say, hmm. I mean, listen, listen to the outer movements of, of the patatique, and you'll you'll hear that very, very clearly. It really is, again, wonderful making the reacquaintance of these performances because they're just marvelous. And Chopin, the waltzes, he, he was not a major Chopin pianist. That wasn't one of his guys, Chopin, that is. But, uh, boy, these are fun to listen to. I, I Again, you'll notice that the these initial releases, you've got Bach, Beethoven, Chopin. He wasn't known that well in the West, Cautious. And so, and so obviously Phillips was saying to him, you know, do some familiar stuff, do some stuff people know. And he had to do the stuff that people knew in such a way that they would sit up and take notice and say, aha, there's a new guy in town. And we did. We absolutely did. So um, this is sort of essential in getting to know him. And like I said, everyone will have their favorite Chopin waltzes. Uh, you know, you've got Rubinstein, you've got Dino Lepati, ha, 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 you know, which is the ultimate in Chopin who waltzed them. But these are gorgeous. He doesn't put a finger wrong. He just doesn't. You may disagree with the interpretation, but you can't disagree with the realization of it because it's so thoroughly well thought out and musically sensible terrific. Ah, now we get to someone who was one of his guys. Liszt. This was hot. I remember when this came out. This is the Anne de Pelerinage third year. It is absolutely fabulous. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. And, um, you know, I really, really like the, uh, well, what's the classic thing in here was Le Judo, Le Judo à la Villa d'Est, which is quite marvelous. The fountains at the Villa d'Est at Lake Como, which is a gorgeous place if you've ever been there. And uh, I'm going to, uh, you know, if you're a ClassicsToday.com insider, I'm putting this video on the inside so I can do a few clips. And this is going to be one of them. The Judo à la Villa d'Est. Glorious. Absolutely glorious. So there's that. Uh, a really surprising disc that most of us won't remember. I did. I've always savored this. This is his Grieg. His piano sonata, which which very few people play if you're not Norwegian, and lyric pieces, Opus 12 and Opus 43. This is the first CD release, according to this. Maybe that was on the back. And wow, you know, what a very pleasant surprise this will be for you folks. I guarantee it. I had the LP back in the day. Remember LPs? Unbelievable. These are these are just charming. I mean, the music is wonderful, and he gives the music, I think, a certain amount of muscle and rhythmic verve, which I find just incredibly appealing. Because you know, the music can take a little more, a little more uh, juice than a lot of pianists want to give it. You know, there's a tendency to languish, and it, you know, to languish. It's based on Norwegian folk music. It's got some rugged rhythmic stuff in it, and he just plays them wonderfully. And the sonata is just amazingly cogent, and it's a beautiful work. It's, it's a big work. I mean, well, a relatively big work. It's only one, two, was it five, 15, 17, 18 minutes in four real movements. A seriously lovely work that deserves the attention. So this is fantastic just for all you, all you Griegophiles or Griegists, or whatever you want to call yourselves. And then, ah, yes, fantastic. List transcriptions of Wagner. This is another famous, famous record. These are played as well as anyone ever will play them. And you get his own transcriptions. He transcribed the Meistersinger Overture fabulously, I might add. Um, check out your insider thingy there. You can hear a little bit of it. And also the, the prelude to Tristan and Isolde. Yes, fabulous. Otherwise, you get the, the Elsa's, you know, brow, bride thing and uh, for the, coming out of the cathedral from Lohengrin. And you get, and you get the, the bridal procession. That's what it's called. Not, you know, me and my German. Uh, and then you get the Liebestod. This is the list transcription, so it goes well with Conscious's prelude. And Parsifal. The Solemn March. Yum. 
Fantastico. Uh, what do we got here? Hang in there. We're getting there. This will go actually pretty quickly because a lot of this music comes in clumps. And I, I'm really happy. Ah, oh, yes. Like, here's a clump. Oh, what a clump. We're seriously clumping. Debussy. I mean, Kochis was simply one of the great Debussy pianists that has ever lived. Thank God he did, like, most of the piano music. Four discs worth. Yes, he did. He did the, both books of preludes. He did the image and the image oublié, and then he did a bunch of short pieces and children's corner and pour le piano and the estampe, and then more little pieces and the sweet bergamasque. And he did the fantasy for piano and orchestra, which is such a lovely work that that nobody plays live. They should. It's beautiful, a beautiful French piano concerto. Nobody knows about and nobody cares about because it's early. And some people say, oh, it doesn't sound so much like Debussy. Well, who cares? It sounds great, whoever it sounds like. And the Ravel Piano Concerti, which are absolutely first class. That's all with the Budapest Festival Orchestra under Ivan Fischer. You know, Kochis was one of the founders with Fischer of the Budapest Festival Orchestra. And he conducted it frequently. Then they had a falling out, shall we say, as artists, you know, tend to. And so he went and founded the Hungarian National Orchestra and the other Budapest whatever. And so he did his own thing with the orchestra. But when they were getting along, they were just marvelous. And so they're just marvelous here. You've got to hear his TBC for finesse and imagination and poetry. It is absolutely up there with the very best that's ever been out there. You can't say it's the best. There's no point in saying it's the best because so many people have done amazing work in Debussy's piano music, but Kochis was one of them. He did not do the etudes. As Jed points out in the notes, and as I you know, remember, he, he declined to do them because Polini's were coming out, and he wanted to clear the way for Polini to make his statement, which was actually a very gracious thing, because Kochis had no problem doing music that other people did. That wasn't the issue at all. So, uh, but the Debussy is, is, is reference stuff. And frankly, uh, you know, I have to say, Phillips slash Decca did not treat this legacy, I believe, with the respect it deserves. When you're a pianist of this caliber and you've only made 26 discs for the label, it's not huge, just keep them in print. I mean, just keep them available and let people discover them. And God forbid, maybe you'll want to promote them once in a while. Wouldn't that be novel? It'd be exciting. Well, now they don't want to do that. So, uh, you know, the, having this box back is fantastic. Who knows how long it'll be around? It's your second chance. Get it. Just get it. And then take your time and savor it. It's a wonderful uh, assortment of repertoire. And wow, the performance has just blown my mind. Oh, speaking of blowing your mind. Yes. One of the other major composers in Kochis's arsenal was Rachmaninoff. He was a dazzling Rachmaninoff compo uh, con com the composer, pianist. Maybe he was kind of a composer pianist, like Rachmaninoff was. I mean, he was as good as Rachmaninoff. And you get the second sonata, these big, fat, thick, gluey thickets of note, second sonata in its original version, the one that no one plays or almost nobody plays. And this is, again, as fine a performance of that second sonata, especially it being the original version, not the later thinned out, um, slimmed down version, the keto version, if you want to call it that. But no, this is the original portly version. And wow, does he nail it. Ah, he nails it. In the meantime, you get some preludes and some etudes tableau. And uh, wow, yummy. Absolutely yummy. Fabulous. So there's this, which you just have to have. You've got to have all of his Rachmaninoff, for sure. We'll get back to that anon. Uh, bar talk. Oh, okay. Now, uh, most of this collection, I mean, the one thing that takes up the most discs in this collection is bar talk. It is CDs 13 through, let's just see, wait a moment. Uh, choo -choo, CDs 13, 20... Oh, my goodness, yes, there's lots of it. And we can deal with it very quickly. Yes, CDs 13 through 20. So it's it's seven or eight discs. One, two, three, four, five, six, yeah, eight discs. And and Conscious is Bartok. This is all the solo music, by the way. We'll get to the concertos at the end of this collection. Um, it was simply unrivaled. It is the reference version for this 
music. Again, there are other wonderful people who have done Bartok's piano music. There really are, but um, nobody matches this. It's that simple. It's, it's the reference version. It has been since the day it emerged. It may still be available separately if all you're interested in is the Bartok. You should have a look because it was in a, issued in a separate box. Um, it's just it's just ideal in in every respect. I mean, every single <laughs> single bit from the teeniest little microcosmos or for children to the Allegro Barbaro and all the dances from everywhere and the the ethnic stuff. Oh, it's just amazing. And what's cool about it is that no piece in this selection is so small that he didn't really think through how he wanted to project it. You know. Because Bartok's piano music is sometimes people can, it can seem a little scattered and some people find it a little disappointing for that reason. He only wrote like one sonata and there's not a lot of music in big forms or or even, you know, large works in, in peculiar forms. They're mostly very small works, but full of personality and full of striking contrast and color and rhythm. And then that's the kind of stuff you've got to bring out. You've got to maximize the individuality of all of these teeny, teeny, tiny little pieces. And that is a job. And Kochis was fully up to it. It's astoundingly wonderful. So there's Bartok. And with that, we're already up to CD20. So like I said, these 26 C CDs, they go by fast. They go by so fast. It's you know, you look at these boxes, I have to say, you look at these little boxes and you realize that you know, there's a life in them. And it's, it, they're, they're a little sad in some ways, don't you think? You know, an entire, an entire career. I mean, there's more to him than that, obviously. There was much more. But there it all is, in a box. And, uh, you know, I don't know. I find it kind of wistful looking at it that way. Mozart, Piano Concertos 1911 and 17 with the Budapest Festival Orchestra, Kochis is conducting. These are wonderfully lively, fresh performances, especially 17. I love 17. And this is one of my favorite recordings of 17. 17 is the one that, that, that ends with the theme and variations. Da da dum bum ba da dum bum 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 da 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 da. You know, with the woodwind parts chuggling on the da 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 da. There we go, I did it. And uh, oh gosh, I enjoyed these performances just hugely. Again, there's a million Mozart people, there's a million great versions of number 17, God knows, including his colleague Andras Schiff's with Shandor Veg. Maybe Hungarians just have a feeling for number 17. It's a possibility, you never know. But these are quite good. And again, um, lesser known performances in his discography. People don't think of him as a Mozartian and they do not remember his concerto performances all that often. And here's another disc that doesn't get a lot of love for reasons I've never quite understood. And it was wonderful. The Liszt Piano Concertos. And coupling, the coupling is even better, frankly, the Dohnani Variations on a Nursery Tune. Why did this disc only last in the catalog for like five minutes? I don't understand. I just don't understand. I mean, the Dokhnani has never been better played. And oh my God, what a great piece it is. We don't hear it anymore. Nobody does it. I've heard it once in my whole life. I, I, it should be as popular as the Rachmaninoff Paganini Rhapsody. It really should. But for some reason, it just isn't. And it's so charming and delightful and full of humor and, and a dazzling virtuoso showpiece. It truly, truly is. And boy, they play it like one. And then the two list concertos. I mean, what is not to love? Kochis, everybody knows, was a phenomenal list pianist. So let's hear some phenomenal list. Why not? So that's great. And then we have, oh, yes. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, my goodness. The Rachmaninoff Piano Concertos and Paganini Rhapsody, all four of them. This is the reference recording in these works. I have no doubt about that. This and, well, okay, this one and Earl Wilde's with Yasha Hornstein. Believe it or not, Hornstein's wonderful there too. But Earl Wilde is absolutely fabulous in Rachmaninoff and so is Cautious. And they're quite different. They're quite different. This is as close to Rachmaninoff's own performances in excellent sound. In other words, they are lean, they're swift, they're incredibly polished and elegant. You'd never know that the music is difficult. 
it, it, it plays itself just about, which is saying a lot with Rachmaninoff because large forms gave him some trouble sometimes, especially like in the third concerto and whatnot. But my God, and this is with Edo Duvart, the San Francisco Symphony, and they are spectacular. And you also get, I mean, I mean the Paganini Rhapsody, which is amazing, is one of the best. 22 minutes and 26 seconds, folks. Here's a tip. If your Paganini Rhapsody goes anything much over 24, 25 minutes, it's horrible. You don't want to do it. it. Your ideal tempo is this one, right around 23 minutes. That, you're just, you're going to be just perfect. You're going to have plenty of internal contrast between the variations, but the basic tempo will be swift and will hold the whole work together. It'll bind it together the way it needs to be done. Marvelous. And you also get the vocalese in Kochis' own transcription, which has since become a popular arrangement among pianists of all stripes. Um, and it is, it is lovely, just lovely. It's a wonderful encore piece, you know. But anyway, here it all is. And these... Oh, my God, when these went out of print, I was so upset because I'd been recommending them for years and years and years, and you couldn't get them. And it was a crime, just a crime, a tragedy, a crime. You hearing me? Crime. Okay, you got it, right? And last but not least, the Bartok Piano Concertos, the modern reference version of those. It really is simply splendid. And you also get the other works for piano and orchestra. You get the burlesque, the scherzo burlesque, it's actually called, and the rhapsody for piano and orchestra. These are these are big pieces. This one's 23. The rhapsody burlesque is, the scherzo burlesque is 29 minutes. It's longer than the concerti. And no one knows them. And they're lots of fun. They're early bar talk. That's why. Again, okay, so they're immature. That doesn't mean they're not fun to listen to. They're incredibly fun to listen to. And best of all, because it was included here, he plays the piano part in one of the reference versions of the music for strings, percussion, and celesta. And that was another version that used to drive me crazy. Oh, God, trying to find it. Because the big box of the piano concerti with all this other stuff went out of print very quickly. There were, it was a series of individual Phillips discs. You know, they looked sort of like this. And they were different colors. And, and then they were boxed up, but they were, then they were gone. And that music for strings, percussion, and celesta is amazing. And it's one of those pieces that there aren't that many great recordings of it. Then it came back on Eloquence. Thank God for Australian Eloquence. They reissued it, coupled to Dorati's Bartok Concerto for Orchestra with the Concertgebouw, I believe. And that was a very nice record to have. But, but here they are, all together as they deserve to be. They should never have been parted. Never, ever. On two really, really well-filled CDs. So, that, my friends, is the Cochis edition and his complete Phillips recordings. And I, I, you know, the complete Phillips recordings on Decca, of course. You know, whatever that means. And uh, I'm so happy this is here. I am so happy that this has come back. I'm delighted to be able to recommend it to you because even if you're not like a pianophile, it's a wonderfully balanced collection. I mean, think about it. You get everything from Bach to Bartok, a little bit, a smidge, with, with deeper explorations of certain repertoire, of, of Bartok, of course, of Debussy, of Rachmaninoff, of some Liszt. And after that, it's a sampling, but every single disc is special in some way and deserving of your attention and your attentive listening, and you are going to just love it. I mean it. Get it while you can. This is the time. And like I said, if you're an insider, go over there and listen to the couple of the samples that I've put up for you to enjoy. You'll hear exactly what I'm talking about. It's not a problem. Believe me, this is the kind of artistry that sells itself. So keep on listening, folks. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.